If a person fatigued with long and hard labor, or with a violent agitation of the mind, takes a good dish of chocolat, he shall perceive almost instantly that his faintness shall cease and his strength shall be recovered. So that, Dominic, was written by Monsieur de Quelou, who, um, as you're probably able to tell, is, was a Frenchman. Was he? He was uh, writing um, in the uh, the early 18th century, yep. and that was translated into English in 1724, and it is from The Natural History of Chocolate. Oh, and you may be wondering what qualified yep. Monsieur de Quelou to uh, to opine on the subject of chocolate. Um, and it was because he had actually he'd spent time out in uh, in the Caribbean, in the French West Indies, where he had been utterly converted to the notion that chocolate was not only tasty, but good for you. I completely agree with him, Tom. But you will find I mean, a very shocking French opinion coming up. Right. Because in the in the opinion of Monsieur de Quelou, um, he, he said that one ounce of chocolate contains as much nourishment as a pound of beef. An ounce of chocolate? Yeah. I'd want more than an ounce. One ounce of chocolate. But, I mean, would you, as, as, a, as a, an Englishman, a yes. proud Englishman... Yeah, absolutely. Would you agree with that, that chocolate outweighs beef? I suppose you could have them both, couldn't you, if you I had a kind of Mexican could. mole, like a beef mole yes. with a chocolate sauce? I guess you could. Anyway, yeah. so to continue um, why uh, Monsieur de Quelou was, was so enthused by chocolate, it is a dish so cheap as not to come above a penny. If tradesmen and artisans were once aware of it, there are few who would not take the advantage of so easy a method of breakfasting. Breakfasting. So agreeably. Right. Yeah, breakfasting. Yeah. At so small a charge, and to be well supported till dinner time, without taking any other sustenance, solid or liquid. I love hearing how uh, Monsieur de Quelou spoke. I think that's a real... Well, that's a real we treat were all the about the authenticity. Yeah. So, so there you have him promoting um, a chocolate as the ultimate kind of breakfast food. Yes. That is, it's so sustaining that it will keep you going right the way up to supper. But he also recommends it as a medicine <laughs> um, and suggests really to enhance the medicinal effects that you should add powders of millipedes, vapors, earthworms... And the livers and galls of eels. The gall of an eel. I'd love a go the gall of an eel. Why haven't people made that in chocolate form? So, um, I, I mean, I, I love chocolate, yeah. but I've never had millipedes or vipers or earthworms or the livers and galls of eels with it. But, I mean, maybe yeah, one day, maybe Tom, some kind of retro, retro chocolate brand. Well, if only there were a retro chocolate brand who would do that. Now, Tom, we do love chocolate on The Rest is History, and we are thrilled, aren't we? We're absolutely thrilled that we're able to do this episode in partnership with our friends at Cadbury. Because do you know what, Tom? It's their 200th anniversary this year. And, Dominic, very important to uh, emphasise that it is Cadbury yeah. and not Cadbury's, so, so Theo, as I had always thought. Well, Theo, our producer, foolishly, always calls it Cadbury's. So he's <laughs> quite wrong, Tom. <laughs> I know. He couldn't be wronger. He probably goes around calling, t talking about Boots the Chemist rather yeah. than Boot the boot, Chemist, exactly. as we all know. Exactly, it is. we all know it's Boot. Right, so, so Dominic, so chocolate. Yes. An amazing substance, it is actually a but also yeah. an amazing history, right? A very rich, a very rich history. <laughs> rich. <laughs> yes. Rich and creamy. Rich and creamy <laughs> history, Tom. Yeah, so I thought what we would do, because we have actually talked about doing a history of chocolate since about, you know, episode 20 of this yeah, podcast. Yeah, we have. Um, so I thought what we would do is in the first half, we talk about the deep history of chocolate. So the Olmecs, the Maya, the Aztecs, the Spaniards. Yeah, because we haven't talked about that for at least, what, two months. <laughs> yes. And then in the second half, chocolate, Tom, there is no better window than a chocolate window into the story of modernity, industrialization. And Victorian Britain. So, where are we beginning? So, should we? I think we should begin with the Olmecs. So, um, our listeners may know the Olmecs as the fellows who made enormous heads, didn't they? Stone they, heads. Yes. In uh, Mesoamerica, they almost look African, don't they? They do. People who were into Atlantis were very excited about these. They were they, indeed. I mean, obviously, they they're indeed. not African. They, no. They or Atlant or Atlantean. No, they're absolutely Olmec. Um, but so they're the very, Olmecs... they're very impressive, aren't they? You must have seen them in the museum in Mexico. In Mexico City. I mean, they're in, in the anthropology museum. Enormous they're kind of cuboid exuding this incredible sense of power. And, and again, an Olmec head made of chocolate, Tom, Goodness. would be a super That would keep thing. you going. So they seem to have believed that uh, cocoa, so they were grinding cocoa beans, which are obviously native to Mesoamerica. And which look like sheep shit, correct? Correct, because uh, when the English privateers right. later on found them, they would throw them into the sea, as we will discover. So uh, the Olmecs, if you're interested in the Olmecs... Um, there's a brilliant uh, book for younger readers, actually, which talks about the civilization <laughs> oh, at the beginning. 
<laughs> called Adventures in Time, The Fall of the Aztecs. But anyway, that's by the by. I just recommend that to the listeners. The Olmecs were the people who invented that bonkers ball game that where you'd hit the ball with your hips. And, and if you lost, court. you'd be killed. And you, you? Oh, exactly, you'd be sacrificed. And some archaeologists think that when you lost this ball game, having your hips, you know, you had bad hips, you lost the ball game, you were sacrificed, that there was somehow cocoa or chocolate drinking at this moment. You So there were crushed cocoa beans that they have found with the bodies of the sacrificial victims. But not kind of like, you know, you, you play a game of football or cricket and then go and have a... A pint. Yeah. You wouldn't kind of come off the ball court. Have a, have a glass a, of chocolate? Have a Bourneville. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think they, they More thought, sacral. Yeah. So they seem to have passed... I mean, so much of this is supposition. So the Olmecs are about 1,500 BC, aren't they? And then they seem to have passed, A, the ball game, and B, the chocolate. tradition of grinding the cocoa beans and making this kind of bitter chocolatey drink. Because it is bitter at this point, isn't it? it? Is. I mean, that's the key thing. Yes. So we're not kind of... There's no sugar. They're not flavouring it with sugar, for example. So they seem to have passed that to the Maya. And the sense we have from uh, what fragments of kind of Maya history we have is that they would drink this chocolate in ritual celebrations and at sort of peace treaties. Would it be social? Would you kind of, you know... Yes, I think... Like you say, you know, have a sherry, you'd say... Have a sherry. Chocolate? Yes, I think that's probably right. Oh, lovely. Thank you. And then the Aztecs... um, the Mexica, as I believe you would call them, Tom. Yes, I would. They were definitely well into their chocolate. So the sense we have is that they would have it in the market, the Tenochtitlan, in the great sort of suburban market they have there. There are lots of uh, cacao beans. And would this be brought as tribute? Yes, I think they are bringing it as tribute. And what is more, they may well have used the beans as barter because, of course, they didn't have a currency. It's one of the things the Spaniards noticed. They're very convenient, aren't they? Yeah, they. I mean, a big pile of beans. Yeah. There's some beans. Even more convenient than gold. Yeah. Which, of course, is what the Spanish have come for. The Spanish have come for gold. Anyway, we don't want to do the fall of the Aztecs no, again, Tom. But I'm just wondering, when the Spanish arrive, yes. do they pick up on the fact that actually these these weird beans are incredibly valuable? Or are, are they initially not interested in them? No, I don't think they are interested in them. Because, of course, they wouldn't seem valuable to them. They may think, well, these people use the beans. But it's not like they're excited about the beans and swapping them among themselves or anything like that. And again, are the, be- are the beans purely for drink? Yeah, or you wouldn't eat them. Again, is there a kind of sacral dimension to it it's so hard to say that's a really good question um so depending who you read there are some accounts you know cortez for example goes to say you know with montezuma we did a a thousand episodes on this um in 1519 and is montezuma giving him hot chocolate to drink and people some historians when they paint the scene such a weird idea they have them drinking kind of (laughs) hot chocolate together (laughs) Um, but if it has this, as you say, sacral significance, which has been passed down over, frankly, thousands of years, is it plausible that they're just sitting around, you know, yeah. Pedro de Alvarado in a gilet, um, <laughs> quaffing... Oh, bloody good chocolate. Good <laughs> mugs of chocolate. I don't know. And I think, we, I think we can't possibly know. Because so much of this we are seeing in a very kind of refracted way um, through sure. the Spaniards' eyes. Okay, so, so how long But all it... the senses... Anyway, Tom, to, to hammer this home, that it is religious, that there is a ritual dimension... Um, and in fact, actually, I should have mentioned this already. We've got a lot of friars. I know you love a friar, don't you? We've got a lot, a lot of accounts from friars. So there's a Franciscan friar called Toribio de Benevente. And he says he went to our old friends, uh, the Tlaxcalans, uh, so the great rival of uh, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. And he says that on the Feast of All Souls in the Indian towns, many offerings are made for the dead. Some offer corn, others blankets, others food, bread, chickens. And in place of wine, they offer chocolate. Right. So there's two two sides to that i guess one is that it's in place of wine which would suggest it is a social drink but the other is that it also plays a part in a religious well ceremony. unless i mean wine has a plays a religious role in christianity yes, so yes, perhaps there's an echo there but obviously chocolate doesn't have any sacral connotations for the spanish no and so how long does it take them to kind of work out that they're worth having well we know when the first instance of them bringing it back to spain is the first recorded instance, I should say, maybe they've done it beforehand, but we have a we have a, um, a source that says it's fifteen forty four. So what's that? A quarter of a century mm. after the Spanish had first pitched up in Mexico, and they present a gift of cacao seeds to King Philip II. He's a very gloomy man, isn't he, Philip II? Mm. You know, he, I don't I don't see him as a chocolate Hanging man. Hanging out in the Escorial. In the Escorial, exactly. Now historians think it, this probably wasn't the very first time. There might have been you know, priests might have brought about merchants and so on. Well, I guess it would be like. Um... You know, old India hands 
bring right. back a taste for curry. Exactly. And they kind of meet up. So yes. maybe old, you know, Mexico hands <laughs> meet up in Madrid, meet up in Madrid, for, Madrid chocolate. for chocolate. Yeah. Maybe I mean, you so. can, well, I mean, seriously. The issue they have with chocolate, of course, is that it is, the, I mean, it's important to stress this point, it's very bitter. So the, hot, the ground up But it's giving stuff, you a caffeine hit. It is. Yes, I guess it is giving you a hit. So there's an Italian guy called Girolamo Benzoni. And in uh, 1575, he was very disobliging about chocolate. He went to Mexico and sort of roamed around a bit. And he said, uh, I won't do it in an Italian accent. He said, it seemed more, a, I will. <laughs> said, for it. <laughs> it seemed more a drink for pigs than okay, a so drink that, for that humanity. Is not. So he says he, he was in there, he was there for a year and he didn't want to drink any. And then he passed, uh, whenever he went past a settlement, somebody would come out and say, <laughs> You know, have, have, have a chocolate. Have a chocolate. And he would, um, he, they would be amazed when he refused it. And they would go away laughing, laughing at him because of his uh, chocolate. Idiocy. But he couldn't find wine. So eventually he cracked and started drinking chocolate. And he said he was very disappointed. So when it gets to Spain, people by that point are, are sweetening it already. I mean, the chocolate that you and I eat, Tom, has been sweetened, obviously. So with, uh, are they getting sugar? They are using sugar. They're using sugar. They're using um, honey. And they're using vanilla. And, of course, the Spanish have already been producing sugar for some considerable time on the Canary Islands. And then they've taken sugar to the Caribbean as well. But there is also an interesting religious dimension, Tom. Have you seen this? I know you love a religious dimension. Well, you think everything is a religious dimension. No, I don't. I I, I had no idea that there was a religious dimension. to Did you not? No. So uh, the issue, I mean, there are multiple issues. But if we sort of cut to the chase... Issue number one is if the uh, Mexica have been using it in their rituals. Oh, is, is it idolatry? Is it idolatry? Is it, is it, yeah, bad bad form to yeah. be drinking chocolate? And it seems that the Dominicans are very down on chocolate. So um, they actually supposedly pester the Pope to, to outlaw it. To, to ban it? Yeah, to say, <laughs> back to ban chocolate. Right. And apparently in 1569, Pope Pius V drank some chocolate and he said it was, and I quote, so foul, he decided there was no need to ban it. <laughs> right. So, so again, no, not a friend of Cabri. Not a friend of Cabri. Um, he's the sort of man who would call it Cabri's, actually, Pope Pius V, a yes. very poor man. Uh, now, the second debate is a big issue for Rishi Sunak. So you may have read, Tom, Rishi Sunak fasts. He does. Yeah, fasts? he might fast all Monday, doesn't he? Yeah. Sunday night to first thing, five o'clock on Tuesday morning. Yeah. Strange time to break your fast, but anyway, there you go. I suppose you, he's got a lot to do. He gets up early, like you. Anyway, he the, issue, the problem for Rishi Sunak with chocolate is, would he drinks tea and coffee? He can do that during. He his can fast. do that. Could he drink chocolate? What would your answer be then? Uh, yeah, I'd have said so. Well, you would agree. It's with, a drink. Um, you would agree with some friars, but not others. So you would disagree with a fellow called Antonio de Leon Pinello. So he's a Spanish lawyer, and he wrote a book, Tom, in sixteen thirty six. Catchy title, Question Moral, Si el Chocolate Quebranta el Ayuno Ecclesiastico, which, as all our listeners will know, is uh, Does chocolate break an ecclesiastical fast? A moral question. And, and he thought it did. He thought it did. He said, This is patently a food. This is, <laughs> this is no drink. <laughs> Wait, is that because it's very thick? Maybe so. I don't know. Maybe he just didn't like chocolate and he wanted to stop people <laughs> drinking it. To diss it. Maybe, but uh, a, d- a different man, Tomás Hurtado, um, who came from an order I read called the. Uh, the Cleric's Regular Minor. Do you know them? You no, I've never were? heard of them. Uh, he wrote another book called Chocolate e Tobacco, Ayuno Ecclesiastico e Natural. So he's in favour. The Jesuits got involved. Um, they got a cardinal. Uh, he wrote a 16-page opinion. How are people writing so much about chocolate? I mean, they, this guy, Cardinal Francesco Maria Brancaccio, he wrote a thing called De Chocolates Potu. <laughs> on the use of chocolate. Right. He said, ah, oh, it's a drink. Come on, it's a drink. And then unbelievably, the Pope, Alexander VII, <laughs> 1666, he pronounced in Latin. Uh, you're good. Do you want to read the Latin, Tom? Liquidum non frangit jejunum. <laughs> Liquids do not break the fast. Yep. Yeah, so he said definitely a... Uh... Well, it's brilliant to know that um, during the Counter-Reformation... <laughs> These questions are dominating the finest brains in yeah. Catholic Europe. During the age of the 30 Year <laughs> War. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, the Spanish would give chocolate to other European courts as a gift. They would say, look at this extraordinary drink. Or and this is spreading at the same time as, as coffee. Yes, presumably. exactly so. So exactly. is there a sense that they're going head to head? I mean, is there a kind um, of a fashion around them? Which is more fashionable, coffee or chocolate? 
I think people, a lot of people are very suspicious of chocolate. The French apparently are very suspicious and wh- of it. And why are they suspicious? Bitter. It's bitter, Tom. Bitter. So they, they, they're not worried about the, the sinister and possibly idolatrous. pagan, idolatrous connotations. And also the point. issue of the fast, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> the Sunak issue. Right. Um, now, the English, uh, of, I mean, the English are the great heroes of the story of chocolate in the 19th century, of course, as we would discover. But at this stage, we are very late adopters, Tom. Right. And this is because every time, say, Francis Drake and all the lads are out capturing Spanish ships. Yes. And they're looking for gold and they pile onto a ship and all they find are cocoa beans. And this yeah. is where the the English feeling that cocoa beans, because they look like sheep droppings, yes. are not worth keeping. And so they just dump them in the sea. Yeah. They just think, what are the Spanish up to? Yeah. Sailing around the Atlantic, despite the fact that by this point, actually, cocoa beans must be coming. It must, must be worth quite a lot. You would assume so, yeah. But they, there is a story. Certainly, in fifteen seventy nine, there's the story of privateers throwing the cocoa beans um, overboard. And then in sixteen forty eight, a chronicler writes and says, he also says the Dutch do this. So maybe a Protestant thing, maybe a Protestant suspicion. I mean, maybe if all <laughs> yes, of these a godly suspicion of <laughs> yeah, all of, these cardinals of, and theologians, of, Catholic yeah. theologians, have been pronouncing on chocolate, and the Dutch English say, "Listen, this yeah, is this is papist nonsense." Yeah. <laughs> so, but obviously, the big turning point is sixteen fifty five, and that is when Cromwell captures Jamaica from right. the Spanish because Dominic. Yes, ha- presumably, you need a certain supply of labor right exactly to uh, harvest this stuff right exactly so and at, where is this labor coming from so at this point what has happened is um people who listen to our episodes about christopher columbus will recall that with the deaths of all the taino people on hispaniola and so on and in the caribbean the spanish started bringing over african slaves and practice they had originated in the canary islands and by the 1650s the African slave population of the Caribbean is, what, about 80% of the whole? And a lot of these islands have effectively been turned into enormous plantations. Sugar, most famously, but also for growing cocoa. cocoa and what's beans. the balance between sugar and cocoa? Uh, sugar is by far the more... OK, um, so so we um, we did an episode, didn't we, on Benjamin Lay, where we talked about what, what life was like yes. in the plantations in exactly the so. late exactly. 17th, 18th century. Yes, so do listen to that. Exactly. So chocolate forms part of that kind of triangular trade. Um, but so the, the English have taken Jamaica in 1655. So then they, they obviously become more invested in the chocolate business, as it were. We get our first recorded mention in 1657. Just and that's in the later. wake of, of the Cromwellian conquest of Jamaica. Exactly. Um, so the public advertiser. Says, and is there a sense that, um, you know, Cromwell sent this great expedition to Jamaica. It's it's basically the only thing that they've got. Yes. It, 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 it's really been a bit of a disaster. Um, and do you think there's a kind of feeling on the part of the Commonwealth that they need to hype up? The, the gains. Fact, yeah, the gains. So, you know, yeah. OK, we haven't got any gold, but we have got this got incredible sh- sheep droppings. Um, I'm not sure about that. I don't think it's directed from on high. I think it's just... Um, it's starting to kind of come in. Yeah, it's just sort of okay. to percolate in, if that's not a, too much of a coffee-based metaphor. <laughs> Um, so anyway, the public advertiser, 1657, and uh, an advertisement says, uh, at a Frenchman's house in Queensgate Alley, actually interesting that it's a Frenchman's house, is an excellent West India drink called chocolate to be sold, where you may have it ready at any time at reasonable rates. And doesn't Peeps drink it? Peeps does drink it. Um, Peeps drinks it in 1664, about noon, out with Commissioner Pet and he and I into a coffee house to drink chocolate. Very good, he says. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah that's lovely. Yeah. And you get our first recipe, our first English recipe about this time, 1650s. They're flavouring it because it is so bitter. So the recipe says put in sugar. It's a very strange recipe, actually. A long red pepper, cloves, aniseed, almonds, nuts, orange water, flour, and cacao. The hotter it is drunk, the better it is, says the recipe's author. Um, so it's still absolutely, at this point, a drink. Oh, it's, it's totally. It's, it's not. They're not kind of making chocolate bars. It is. No, it's totally. You can't make a chocolate bar. And we'll get on to how you make a chocolate bar in due course. It's totally a drink. It is uh, exp- very expensive. So there's high import duties on the beans that come from the Caribbean. So about 50 pence per pound, which is a lot of money. Um, so one historian's done the calculation. That's a week's work for a skilled tradesman to buy a pound of um, cocoa beans. And the way you would buy it, it they, you would buy it ground. So a bit like you're buying ground coffee. Mm-hmm. And it would be sort of pressed into a little cake wrapped in paper. And because it's so expensive, these cakes are tiny. I mean, they're a couple of ounces. They're not, they're not big at all. 
But by the late 17th century, you have chocolate houses. And the most famous one is Mrs. White's Cocoa House or Mrs. White's Chocolate House, which is in St. James's. And some of our listeners will have heard of the oldest of all St. James's Gentlemen's Clubs. Oh, White's. Which is White's. That's what that, that's what it is. Oh, right. White's, the club, which I think David Cameron's father Yes, and all the, I think all the, from all the waiters are called George. Yes, something like something that. Something like that. And they have one of those, you know, betting books that yeah. like Brooks's and the other yeah. clubs have uh, with amusing bets placed by the Duke of Wellington or Involving something. Involving balloons. Yes, things. exactly. So White's um, was, I mean, it was a chocolate, it was a, it was a chocolate shop. How brilliant. And it was notorious, apparently, because rakes would go and be- have <laughs> lewd conversations over their chocolate. Fruit and nut, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Damn Dan- your eyes. <laughs> so Daniel Defoe, uh, he said fathers should warn their daughters of the evils of promiscuous conversations that take place in chocolate houses. Wow. So, yeah, watch out. And actually, chocolate does have... So, this is interesting. Chocolate clearly plays multiple roles so one thing it's not it's absolutely not is for children there's no well, no of... because if it's if it's Expensive. associated with rakes and promiscuity right uh, and idolatry uh, well <laughs> presumably not idolatry but not this at this point. point no 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 but rakes and but hellfire clubs and things exactly so it's and this reputation lasts quite a long time the idea that it's an aphrodisiac so right yes. the colonies for example preserve this so the virginia almanac 1770 warns the fair sex to be in a particular manner careful how they meddle with romances, chocolate, novels and the like. Especially in the spring, it says, these are all inflamers and very dangerous. And is that where the um, the kind of association of chocolate with romance comes from? Like in the flake, like a flake, Tom. Well, like I, the flake advert I mean, you know, the woman you know, it's in kind the bath. Of Valentine's chocolates, that kind of thing. I guess so, yeah. Chocolate is regarded as erotic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, people don't regard Tea or coffee is erotic. No. So big tea and big coffee. <laughs> They've missed out. They have missed out. So it's it's an aphrodisiac. Bizarrely, it's also a breakfast drink. Right. So, <laughs> well, get the day off. To, yes. With a bank. So it's always been a breakfast. Because so, so like, um, what, what's bank, his name? With a bang, um, Tom. Uh, Monsieur de Kelou. I mean, he, yeah, he he's, said he's, he's marketing it as a breakfast, breakfast drink. Exactly. Uh, in 1796, a guy called John Perkins said the general breakfast to people from the highest to the lowest is tea, coffee, or chocolate. Um, uh, there's an 18 a court book as late as 1814 Maria Rundell a new system of domestic cookery she says cocoa a light and wholesome breakfast <laughs> she has this recipe for a si- you make a, basically a, a chocolate syrup and you can store it for up to a week and you add it to m- milk and then you make a big hot chocolate bowl of hot chocolate and that's your breakfast that's your breakfast and, and you know what when I did my French exchange in the 1980s the the we all drank chocolate at breakfast, bowls of chocolate oh, well, at breakfast. Monsieur the, de Kelou would be yeah. thrilled to know that. But the French men of the house, he drank beer at breakfast. Right. And we all drank hot chocolate. The other thing, Tom, is it's medicinal. So um, I think you mentioned at the beginning, didn't you, mixing it with eel's gall mm-hmm. and eel's livers. Vipers and earthworms. Vipers. <laughs> that is absolutely the... Th- I mean, that is very common in the 18th century. Apothecary shops would sell chocolate. And they would. You went in with, you know, a, a cough, a, a, yeah, a hangover. Gall of eel. You said you uh, your libido was in poor shape. You he would. There's nothing say, like a gall of eel <laughs> no, to, to get, <laughs> get the blood coursing. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin apparently recommended chocolate as a cure for smallpox. That's the kind of idiocy that leads to tax rebellions. <laughs> it absolutely uh, is. <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson, not a friend of the rest, is history, as is on record. Uh, he wrote a letter to our old friend John Adams. Oh, Tom. yeah. <laughs> he said... What did he say? He did American colonial voice. He said, Hello, my lover. The, su- <laughs> the superiority of chocolate, both for health and nourishment, will soon give it the preference over tea and coffee in America, which it has in Spain. Well, that's not true, is it? It's not true. Cause I mean, Americans... so, so um, Thomas Jefferson yeah. also believed that out in the west of... Uh, America, there were mastodons to be found. Absolutely. And he was wrong about that as well. Wrong about almost everything, I think it's fair to say, Thomas Jefferson. Right, we're halfway through, Tom. And I think the great conclusion we can draw from this, the overriding thing is that chocolate is a drink. Yes. Nobody has eaten chocolate at this point. But also how exotic it is. It's exotic, it's exciting, it's erotic, it's medicinal. It's a 
great breakfast food. <laughs> it's got, well, but, it's a but breakfast it's drink. Yes. It's a breakfast drink. It's not a breakfast food. Yeah. You've, betrayed your, you've betrayed yourself there. But the good news for you is that all this is about to change. It's one of the great turnarounds, actually. One of the most astonishing revolutions in history. Because in the second half, Tom, chocolate will become a food. Well, we're approaching that momentous date of 1824 when Cadbury was founded. Very good. So after the break, we will get on to that. One of the great moments in history. Can't wait. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We are talking about the history of chocolate. Hitherto a liquid, but soon to become a bar. <laughs> Would that be fair? <laughs> that is be- fair. Be- because we, uh, we are now approaching um, uh, basically a wave of Quakers. Yes. Um, and we're being sponsored by a, a company that is named after one of those um, participants in the wave of Quakers, John Cadbury. Yes. But there are loads of them. There are loads, loads of Quakers. Well, there are, I would say, I'd be tempted to say there are, there are Cadbury's plural, but that would get me into trouble with the company because their name is Cadbury, Tom, not Cadbury. Cadbury. Yeah, Cadbury, not Cadbury's. So that was 1824 they started, Tom. But let us rewind to 1624. Because before we get on to a wave of uh, Cadbury's... Well, 1650s, really. We've got... Well, 1624 is the date that a fellow called George Fox was yes. born. And he's a, he's a man very dear to your heart, isn't he? Well, so so um, we, we're very keen on Quakers on the rest of history. So Benjamin Lay was a Quaker and Mary Fisher, who was uh, the most recently crowned... Um, Queen of Historical Love Island, wasn't she, she? Was, with, Tony with Tony Ben? ben. Yeah. So um, she was a Quaker as well. And it all kicks off, as you say, with this guy, um, George Fox, who is born in 1624. But the the Quaker movement doesn't really start kind of taking wing until the 1650s. Right. So the same decade that the English... Taking Jamaica. Te- take Jamaica. The, the years of chocolate. But back in England, it's a, a period of religious turmoil. The king's been executed. Yes. Cromwell is, is in charge. Um, and there is kind of freedom of religious opinion. Cromwell is very keen on that. And the Quakers essentially are, um, they're a kind of very radical Protestant sect. Um, They are are kind of seeking the light within them. Um, And when they feel this light descend on them, there's kind of uh, ecstatic, shaking, trembling, roaring, yeah. foaming at the mouth, sobbing. So the scenes sobbing. at one of our Rest is History club get-togethers. Yes, it absolutely is. And so the name Quaker begins as an insult, but it, you know, like so so many other things, it becomes a kind of badge of pride. Um, There's something to do with hats. They, 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 well, they won't take their hats off. They won't take their hats off because they are, and, and women refuse to curtsy. So there's a kind of very moving story um, which Alec Ryrie in his his wonderful book on on Protestants tells. There's a servant girl who is in attendance at a kind of aristocrat's table, mm. and all the all the lords and rakes are, are laughing at the fact that she won't curtsy, and they offer her twenty pounds to curtsy, and she replied that even if he offered her his entire estate, I durst not do it, for all honour belongeth to God. Oh. And so, in that principle, there is no titles, uh, no clergy. Absolute sense of human equality, gender equality, and a kind of sobriety. Um, and in the 1650s, this is pushed to very radical extreme, so much that so that that Quaker evangelists will appear in marketplaces and take their clothes off. So, you know, like Adam, yeah. going back to the kind of the lost innocence yeah. of uh, that prevailed in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Um, but in the wake of that kind of convulsive decade, Quakers become well, I suppose more sober. I was about to um, say, later Quakers are the very last people who would take their they, clothes yeah. off in public, aren't they? Yeah, they are. The so that kind of radical tradition tends to, to, to fade. Yeah. But the, the absolute commitment to gender equality and social equality, um, pacifism. Um, philanthropy. Philanthropy. Um, so I think to, to, to modern modernise, they seem a very kind of attractive they do. Christian sect. But they're also the, they're driving modernity, aren't they? So in the 18th century... An age of extraordinary change. And then the early 19th century, Quakers are in the forefront of that. So it's Quakers. Um, people from Shropshire will be delighted to have me mention, hear me mention that uh, Abraham Darby is a Quaker from Shropshire and it's a Darby family that's responsible for the world's first Iron Bridge, Tom. And where is that, Dominic? So that's in Iron Bridge in Shropshire. It's one of is the that, great yeah. tourist destinations You've never in, mentioned it. In, in all the world. The Stockton-Darlington Railway, which we talked about in our Railways episode with Dan Jackson, yeah, but it's that not, was owned by a Quaker. It's not Stonehenge, is it? Uh, Josiah Wedwood. Josiah Wedwood, yes, great potter. Potter was a Quaker. 
Uh, and Quakers are very, very active in trade and in banking. I think because they've been pushed to the margins, haven't they? In, yes. Of English life, so a little so, bit like Jews as well. Like Jews and, and Armenians. And there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of um, kind of cross fertilisation between Jewish and Quaker communities, right? Um, in the Netherlands and in England. So Quakers are because Quakers are not respectable. They can't really make headway in the traditional professions. So they open shops. They right. Open so banks. they're not Anglican. So therefore, they can't go to Oxford and Cambridge, for instance. Exactly. Exactly. And the other thing, of course, so not so Barclays and Lloyd's both have a Quaker history. They're the two banks. And as you said, the, because the, I mean the Quakers become very sober. I mean they are literally sober, aren't they? Because they're yeah, all about so they're temperance. They're not drinking wine. Exactly. So it's like the poor Italian in Mexico, um, who uh, they, you know, there's no wine. Yes. And so he he ends up having to drink chocolate. So had he been a Quaker, he'd probably have got stuck into the chocolate straight away. So, but this is why Quakers are getting into chocolate, is it? Because yeah, exactly, it's an alternative to alcohol. exactly. So there are two families in particular, two Quaker families who are who are really interesting in the the sort of the the history of Britain and chocolate. And it is Britain that is a, a chocolate pioneer in many ways in the 19th century and ends up leading the world in chocolate. Hooray. Um, yeah, top nation, Tom. Um, in so many respects, and chocolate just happens to be one of them. What can I say? So the first family is called the Fries. Now, Fries, of course, are now part of uh, Cadbury. So <laughs> Joseph Fry, he's a very kind of plain, puritanical kind of Quaker fellow he starts an apothecary business um, in Bristol. He sells chocolate from his apothecary shop. Obviously, it's medicinal. But he sells, he sells it, interestingly, to people in newly fashionable Bath. Oh, does he? Yes. So he has a cocoa manufactory. Does he? And he uses water power to, to grind. So to he's industrializing. He's an industrialist. It's the industrialization of chocolate. It is. That's what's so interesting. Mm. So by the early 1800s, the fries have the biggest cocoa works in the world. That is such a source of patriotic pride. But there's bad, there's bad form to come because actually the Dutch are still hanging around. Oh, no. Everybody thinks that Dutch history has ended in 1688 when they came to England, but no. Actually... It's still going on, is it? Yes, there's a guy, there's a, there's, a, there's a father and son, they're called the Van Houtens, Kasparus and Kunrad Van Houten. And in the 1820s, it turns out that they invent a machine. Now, this is complicated, Tom. I don't, we're not the rest is mechanics. <laughs> but uh, this machine will I basically... Shall listen. I, should, I should look forward to you explicating it for me then. <laughs> this machine, it presses the fat from roasted cocoa beans. So How what does it, does it do is, that, Dominic? Well, you bring down one thing and then it presses out something else. The fat oozes so, out, doesn't so it? So the, the centre of the bean, as you will know, is called the... It's called the nib. The, the nib. Bean. The nib. And uh, the uh, centre of the bean has a lot of uh, natural fat in it. And basically, it's a hydraulic press. And it presses this out. So we've got a, a sort of a cake of... of, of Cocoa powder with fat, without sans fat. There's no right. fat in it. But now what you do, you mix that powder with sugar, and then you mix it with the fat, the cocoa butter that you'd pressed out. Mm -hmm. That creates a solid. So this is a chocolate bar, and this is chocolate that you would eat. So Joseph Fry, he still basically takes this process. I was about to say steals, but that would be completely unfair. No, you wouldn't have a Quaker stealing. No, absolutely not. So he says, listen, I'm going to use this kind of machinery and I am going to mix this business with like more and more of the cocoa butter and that will make it more easily moldable and therefore we will invent a chocolate bar. And he invents a chocolate bar. He exhibits it at trade fairs. Um, and then in 1853... He sells something called the Fry's Cream Stick. <laughs> and, and that, Tom, evolves into something that still exists, the Fry's Chocolate Cream. Goodness. Now, we said there were two Quaker families. Yes. And it's important now uh, that we unveil the other one. And there's a third family called Roundtree Family in York, but we don't have time to really talk okay, about it. Okay, so uh, have, have we now arrived at... Cadbury. Yeah, Cadbury, or the, or the, the Cadburys, uh, as some people might wrongly call them. So they are from Birmingham. Oh, right. Which is nice. Like my dad. Yes. So the Holland family are from Birmingham, aren't they? Uh, the workshop of the world, Tom. Yeah. Second city of the empire in the 19th century. Yeah. Tremendous place, Birmingham, the great boom town of kind of late 18th century, early 19th century. Britain, I suppose, to some extent, the successor to Manchester as the kind of 
crucible of modernity. Yeah. So absolutely the kind of place that would love a chocolate bar. Absolutely. So, so this is the, kind of the most cutting edge food that you can get. Yes. Most cutting edge place, most cutting edge food. So in 1824, this chap called John Cadbury, who's a Quaker, he opens a shop at 93 Bull Street, Birmingham, and he sells tea, coffee and cocoa. So at that point, in his mind, it's a drink and it's kind of, you know, it, it coexists with tea and coffee. Um, he grinds his own beans in a pestle and mortar, very time consuming, no doubt. But he opens a factory in 1831. Uh, and he, like Fry, is inspired by this Dutch machine. Right. Um, the difference between Cadbury and the, their competitors is that they are much more high end. Well, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's the best. <laughs> The best kind of chocolate, isn't it? Um, so, listen, the other their, their competitors will... will um, I'm sorry to say this reflects poorly on Britain. They will um, adulterate their chocolate powder with brick dust. With brick dust? <laughs> or with lead. That, <laughs> that's very kind of Charles Dickens, isn't it? It is. Kind of hard times. Um, but Capri's uh, don't do that. They they do have potato flour in there and a bit of treacle and a bit of sago. But, I mean, who doesn't love a bit of that? A bit well, of, but a lot of that. people would pay good money for that. I mean, they, and in fact, they do. But not brick dust. Um, and, and not vipers or earthworms no. or the gall of eel. And actually, John Cadbury gets a reputation. People say he is the chocolatier to the stars. He is the chocolatier to Queen Victoria, no less, because he gets a royal warrant. So she is amused. Any other cocoa manufacturer. He makes a line called Queen's Own Chocolate, the, the cu- purple colouring that so many people associate with Cadbury. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the was purple, honor. purple wrapping paper. It was the royal purple, Tom. Tyrion oh, right. purple. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, okay, yes. Yeah. So we were talking about that, weren't yeah, we, in so our episode episodes. on the Phoenicians? Yes. Uh, I had not imagined there'd be a link between the Phoenicians and on And the, they chocolate. would have wrappers with the likeness of uh, Victoria and Albert on them, right. which is lovely. So Cabra did was doing really well by the 1860s or so. It was very high-end, posh chocolate. Um, his sons, Richard and George, take it over. But they still have the issue that all the chocolate companies have, is how do you differentiate yourselves from your rivals? Fruit and nut. Well, not at this point, Tom. I know you like a fruit and nut. I love fruit and nut. But, um, but no, actually, what they think of as their secret weapon is a thing called um, Iceland, <laughs> Iceland moss. Iceland moss? Yes. Yeah, so are you familiar? Have you eaten this chocolate before? No. Well, I, well you wouldn't have done if you didn't. If you, I mean, it's from the 1860s. Is it literally moss? It's lichen. Oh, uh, so they chocolate with light. Yeah, they blend the fa- the ch- the bean with the. Is it lichen or lichen? It's lichen, isn't it? Lichen. They 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 blend the two, and they make a bar of chocolate. Um, it's it's, got, it's bizarrely it's in, sold in yellow packaging. You don't often see a yellow. Packaging. And and what's the, what's the point of this? They say it's got a reindeer on the packaging, um, and it shows how healthy it is. Right, it's very healthy because you're getting some moss, some some lichen, <laughs> and you're getting some chocolate, and it's from Iceland. But it seems a weird thing. I mean, yeah. because people aren't normally tucking. I mean, you you would have fruit and you would have nut, and so the presence of fruit and nut right. in a Cadbury chocolate bar are you, are is, you, is, is a guarantor. You've got fruit and nut on the brain, Tom. Well, I'm I'm, I'm rather hoping to become an influencer, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, a bit like with biscuit tea, right? I'll get, yeah, get fruit and nut chocolate bars. I'm I'm but, I'm holding out for a, an Iceland moss, but contract. lichen, yeah. Nobody eats that. Do you want to know what the um, the aptly named historian Deborah Cadbury says about uh, Iceland moss? Tom? Yeah, tell me. The untried combination of fluffy textured lichen and fatty <laughs> cocoa bean would not excite the English palate. <laughs> right. So this was not a success. So there are so many retro ways to do chocolate. But this is that, that... <laughs> yeah, this is hipster chocolate. Isn't yeah, it? it's absolutely it's the ultimate hipster chocolate. So they do now. The mentioning the wrapper with its yellow wrapper with its reindeer. This is quite a new departure for a Quaker company because the Quakers had hitherto been very suspicious of puffery. So that's advertising. Advertising. Well, they would be, yeah. But by the late 1860s, actually, Cadbury are leading the world in advertising. Are they? They are. They get endorsements from The Lancet and the British Medical Journal. Well, saying chocolate is good for you. Chocolate is good for you. Medicinal, mix it with an earthworm. Brilliant. Yeah. You're laughing. <laughs> um, they have picture boxes, which previously Quakers had been very suspicious of. Don't put pictures on your chocolate. And what pictures are, what are they well, putting on? Of Queen Victoria. Right. Um, <laughs> they're, um, they're advertising lovely. Oh, here's one. A Birmingham Gazette says, uh, pictorial novelties, chaste yet simple. A blue-eyed maiden, some six summers old, designed and drawn by Mr. Richard Cadbury. Okay, so a little bit of Victorian yeah, sentimentalism. Exactly. And they launched their first Easter egg in 1875. 
And is that the first ever? Or? I think Fry and, and Cadbury actually actually contest that title. Do they? I think well, we'll, ask, let's go for Cadbury. Well, yeah, I, I, well if, done, if that'll make you happy, yeah. Um, and they also go very upmarket. So they're very, very upmarket. Their slogan is absolutely pure, therefore best. <laughs> in the world yeah. which reminds me Dominic so while this is happening in Britain yes the Americans must surely be developing I mean no offence to our American listeners oh, shocking but, but they're they're terrible the chocolate terrible chocolate yeah and um, and the, the the Swiss they're very they're, the they Swiss become are very famous comers. for the Swiss are latecomers Lint and Nestle they invent a thing called the conching machine um, I don't really understand how that works, quite frankly. But what's the effect? It conches the chocolate, <laughs> right, and okay. it makes it very smooth. I'm, I'm glad that's been. Ch- it clear makes that. it, it makes it very smooth. <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, you're absolutely right to raise the issue of American chocolate. That is a, a huge puzzle, because they've obviously got an enormous market, um, but their chocolate is, I mean, it's abhorrent and abject, isn't it, Tom? Without being rude, to them. like their cheese. Like the cheese. Yeah, what's going yeah. on? Anyway, maybe our American listeners, if they're, if they're <laughs> any <laughs> left, will, will let us know in, in no uncertain terms. So anyway, that's the product. That's what Cadbury are selling. But actually, the really interesting thing is is where they are making it and what their workers are doing. And are they making it outside Birmingham? They are, Tom. They are. So they're still making it in Birmingham. Um, in 1878, they bought some rural farmland uh, just outside the city. Uh, through which a stream runs called the Bourne. Right. And they call this Bourneville. So French for town. Exactly. So the calling things Ville at this point is seen as quite an upmarket Frenchified <laughs> right. thing to do. Um, the Bourneville factory um, becomes the sort of physical embodiment of the Quaker principles that the family actually still espouse. So George Cadbury, who's now the big cheese in the family, he'd been a teacher in a school for working men in Birmingham. Um, He was really into kind of liberal-minded campaigns in the sort of 1860s, 1870s. So against against chimney sweeps. Against chimney sweeps, exactly. exactly. Lord Shaftesbury. Give people better conditions, better housing, clean things up. I mean, it's part of that sort of... Joseph Chamberlain era. Of... Well, it's it's the kind of the high-minded Victorian exactly. spirit that people laugh at. Yeah, but, but we have not earned the right to laugh at because no. it's completely admirable. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree Anoraic. with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. So, as an employer, I mean, he is very obviously very paternalistic. But as you say, he's very admirable. He says, "Let's have bank holidays. Let's have a five and a half day working week." I mean, this is at a time when a lot of employers would say, "Don't give people so much as a minute's break all week." Um, he gives the workers more rights, better conditions, all that kind of thing. And then by the 1890s, he starts to go well beyond that and to become a real pioneer. So what he does in the 1890s, he buys 120 acres of land by the factory. Uh, and he says, I'm going to plan a model village for my workers and I call it Bourneville. And it will, and I quote, alleviate the evils of modern, more cramped living conditions. So that's 1893. They start rebuilding really it in 1894. And by 1900, they do build things a lot more quickly <laughs> than uh, than we do. In 1900, they have basically built this village out of nowhere. It has more than 300 cottages and houses. Have you been to Bourneville? Uh, no, I ha- I've never been. Have you not? But, but I have read uh, Jonathan Coe's brilliant novel, Bourneville, a, yeah. which is all about it. Right. It's it's a really... I mean, if you were going to live in a suburb, that's where you'd live. But isn't this near where Tolkien moves? Yeah. He gets very upset about it and basically compares it to Mordor. And yet, but the weird thing is that Tolkien should like it because, like all of these sort of garden villages of the 1890s, it's quite 1900s, shire. it's quite shire like, yeah. The buildings are kind of, you know, late Victorian, Edwardian, vernacular, English vernacular. They're kind of. Hampstead Garden Suburb. Yeah, Hampstead, exactly yeah. that. They are kind of very, a bit William Morris y. They're meant to be a little bit arts and craftsy. Um, So they're modern inside by the standards of the time, but they are very much done in a kind of traditional English style. You know, it's it's a sort of, it's it's the country in the city, Mm -hmm. as it were. Rusinobe. Exactly so. And it has a very, you know, 1900s kind of team spirit kind of ethos, you know, the age of the Boy Scouts and so on. So they have um, evening classes. And actually, if you want to get a job at Bourneville, in you know 1910 or something and you are a young person one of the conditions of your employment is that you will have to go to evening classes and be improved and how do we feel about that i think it's brilliant i think it's what it's what, it's what football clubs do tom with uh, their apprentices they force right. them to study i don't know, they make them do latin but they make them do maths or something right well, right too 
there are lots of games. There are games for women, interestingly, sports for women. Um, uh, they and then they do them in work time, so they have two half hour sessions a week. They don't lose pay. They're paid to go to those sessions, and they sort of play ball games and do gymnastics and stuff. And the thinking is. They'll be healthy, but also they'll be better workers. And obviously, there's no opportunity to go and get drunk. No, exactly. But you could go for a restorative chocolate. Yes, you would. after the <laughs> after your ball game. Um, so it's just like uh, Central America, in... and <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like the Olmecs. AD like one thousand, exactly. Ball games uh, and chocolate, um, but no human sacrifice. Obviously, no human sacrifice. At least not that we're aware of. Uh, there is a company culture. They're one of the first companies, if not the first company, to have a genuine company culture. So they have their the Bourneville Works magazine that's launched in 1902. There is um, this sort of spirit that actually is easy. People sneer at it now or they sniff at it and say it's very paternalistic. But you know, the ethos of the magazine, I'll read you the quote, to promote what, for lack of a better word, we may describe as the Bourneville spirit, to foster comradeship and good fellowship, and to add one more to the links binding together the community at Bourneville in mutual service. That is quite Tolkien, isn't it? It is a it bit is Tolkien, fellowship of the ring. Yeah, and they, they deliver on a lot of these promises. So they have a benefit scheme, they have a pension scheme. So pensions, as our community manager, James Regan, would be the first person to say, were brought in famously by his hero, H. H. Asquith. <laughs> But yes. actually, Bourneville got there first. So men's, men had pensions in 1906. So even better than Asquith. Women in I mean, that is high praise. <laughs> that is the highest praise. <laughs> actually, Asquith is not a man who would have drunk chocolate, is he? No. <laughs> a temperance town would not have been to his taste. No. And Bourneville still has, there's more than 20,000 people there. So have you are, you are you aware of the work of the actress Felicity Jones? Mm, I don't know. She's Stephen Hawking's wife in that film with Eddie Redmayne. Didn't see it. She was also, we did an episode about Star Wars, she was the lead in Rogue One, which is an excellent film, arguably the best of the recent Star Wars films. She's from Bourneville. Is she? So there's a lovely fact. Wonderful. So that's Bourneville. Shall we get back to uh, chocolate, Tom, before we completely run out of time? Yes. So the great news for people who uh, like British chocolate is that as we approach the First World War, Britain leads the world, unquestionably. Oh, great days. In the <laughs> chocolate. So Cadbury is now the world's biggest chocolate producer and it's by far the biggest exporter because, of course, it has the empire. So we're exporting Cadbury chocolate, fries, round trees, all this stuff. So the British Empire, not it's going bad. Out. It's, going, it's going out to Australia. Excellent for British chocolate. Brilliant for British chocolate. Very, very exciting moment. Uh, in 1905, the most famous chocolate bar in the world is launched, Tom. That chocolate bar is, of course, the Dairy Milk. Mm-hmm. And that was um, the interesting thing about the dairy milk is that the emphasis is very much on the milk and not on the chocolate. So this is more Quaker, yeah. You know, healthy glass of milk, healthy glass of milk. And go off and well, the the logo is still a glass of milk, I think, isn't it? On yeah, the... it is. Yeah. And actually, the names they considered before they went for dairy milk were calling it either a Highland Milk Bar or a Dairy Made Bar. Dairy and they made. went for Dairy Milk. Dairy Made, I think, is an ice cream, an ice lolly. Is they had dairy made ice lollies. Milk made ice lollies, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, maybe. maybe. I didn't like them. But... Highland milk is just too Scottish, I think. They have yeah. a sort of tartan wrapper. Well, yeah. Um, like a Tunnock's tea cake. Yeah, uh, but nothing wrong with that. No, uh, no, that's fair. But Tunnock's are not involved with this podcast, so we can't get <laughs> No, I'm happy to go on the record that I love a Tunnock's tea cake okay. as well. Okay, fine. However, Tom, I'm sorry to say the Great War was bad news for chocolate. And for chocolate firms. Or oh, specifically for British chocolate. Yeah. So the good, the, the, there's one bit of good news. Surely it's good news for American chocolate, isn't it? It is. It's, yeah. Um, so British chocolates, British chocolate makers were allowed, they supplied the soldiers in their trenches with chocolate. So you got chocolate as part of your ration. And this was, I mean, Cadbury's did that, or indeed Cadbury did it. And they provided books and clothing for the troops as well. Um, international competitors like Nestle and Lint were completely frozen out of that for obvious reasons. What about Hershey's? Hershey's. I mean, who would have Hershey's? Would you have Hershey's chocolate? I guess the GIs. They would, but they didn't turn up until 1918 or something, <laughs> did they? So, I mean, that, that's by the by. Um, it does lead to greater cooperation between the different Quaker companies. They've been talking about this, actually, since before the First World War. We're all Quakers. Let's, kind of joining up. Let's join up and yeah. have one massive Quaker chocolate company. Um, they have massive shortages of milk and sugar. And uh, so that some of them are struggling. So fries, for example... And actually, not, by 1918, they're talking about why don't we merge into, why don't we absolutely do this and merge into one big company? The Roundtree company says no, but the Fries company say yeah, let's do it. So in 1919, they form a company with the splendid name of the British Cocoa and Chocolate Company. It's not as catchy as as what 
Cadbury. Is it not? No. It's the BCCC? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, if that's your view, Tom. I, that I, is my view. I'm not gonna, clearly not going to persuade you. So um, Britain comes out of the war. And actually, I think in some ways you could say this is the point at which chocolate is completely embedded, Tom, mm. in British national life. To a degree that's exceptional? I think it is exceptional, actually. I think there are more products in Britain. There are more consumers. Um, there's a greater volume of production uh, right. than anywhere else in the world. And have they started, um, you know, adding bits of orange peel and yes. well, fruit and nuts? And, you know, yeah. You've all this blowing been, bubbles into it. Yeah. You're mad about the fruit and nuts. And they absolutely are. So you get... Uh, the fruit and nut, the Bourneville fruit. They make a dark fruit and nut before a milk one, interestingly. Oh, God, I love both. So the Bourneville fruit and nut is 1924. The milk fruit and nut is 1926. And the flake. When do you think flake was uh, invented? Uh, 1932. 1920. It 1920. predates, predates the fruit wow. and nut. And actually, there's some technical development that allows them to produce the flake. But I don't understand what it is. Uh, was it's it again, that it, thing that um, it's the not, it's not the conching? Invented. No, it's it not wasn't con conching. No, some other form of flake machine. <laughs> <laughs> was it Dutch? Uh, I think the Dutch are this. Uh, they're out of history. They're, out of they're been not out of history. But so there's more products, and far, far more people are eating chocolate. So to give you an indication, all that we've talked about actually it was still a relatively elite thing and a middle class thing. So in 1900, only one in 30 families households in Britain at chocolate regularly because it's expensive and after the war that's no by 1930 nine out of ten families or households and is that have... because lots of soldiers have got the habit They've got in the, the trenches bug, but also it's really cheap it's just technological advanced you know um innovations mean that it can be produced much more cheaply the price of a dairy milk fell by 70 percent in the decade after the great war so sales go through the roof um, and and now really the the companies are, can say we are genuinely, you know, mass national enterprises. So the Bourneville Works magazine that I quoted before in 1934 they say very proudly, at Bourneville we cater for the man in the street, his wife and family, the poor man at the gate rather than the rich man in his castle. So it, it is a kind of long process of both globalisation. And democratisation. It is. So, so a, a product once given to King Philip II yeah. is now being given to the the ordinary folk of Birmingham and the black country. It's wow. a lovely story, Tom. And they say that history has no sense of progress. No. What nonsense. Well, you know what Sir George Orwell said about chocolate in the Great no? Depression? So people carried on eating chocolate in the Depression. Did it involve clogs? Uh, <laughs> effectively. Orwell said, and I think it's in the Roads of Wigan Pier, he said, uh, it is quite likely that fish and chips, art silk stockings, tin salmon... Cut price chocolate, five two ounce bars for sixpence. The movies, the radio, strung tea, and the football pools have between them averted revolution. Marvellous. Mm. <laughs> so, so, isn't it? It's lovely, Tom. Jumpers for goalposts. So, it was. Uh, so it was chocolates that we have to thank for there being no British Revolution in the nineteen thirties. And isn't that a lovely thought? And on that bombshell. Thanks to Cadbury for sponsoring us and Dominic giving us the opportunity to do this episode on chocolate that we've been yes. wanting to do for ages. I've been craving it, Tom. Yeah. Well, I have to say that doing this episode has definitely sharpened my desire to have some fruit and nut. What's, right. it, what's your favourite? So I'll be I'll go on the record now. If if anyone from Cadbury is listening, just I mean, you don't have to send them, but I do like a double decker. Double decker. I'm a big fan of a double decker. With the with the nougat. I like the contrasting textures inside the double Do decker, Tom. Okay. So this is something that American chocolate does not get. Thank you very much for uh, this wonderful tour through the history of chocolate. And thank you, everyone else, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>